Welcome everybody to this week's Lumix Live. Uh, obviously, this is a second one that we're doing for this week. Uh, we just got done on Tuesday, for those of you that have already joined us before, uh, on the brand new Lumix BGH1 box camera. Uh, we felt that obviously there were a ton of questions that we weren't able to get to on Tuesday with the presentation and everything. So uh, Matt and I wanted to have a follow up and kind of dive a little bit deeper into kind of a lot of the cool features that him and I have been really utilizing over the past couple of weeks that we've been using this camera uh, and take a ton of questions from you guys in the audience. Um, so remember to be tagging at Lumix cameras in the chat section below so that we can see the questions on our end and we can, you know, fold them in as we're having the conversation. This will be a little bit more of a kind of free flowing ish stream than we've, we've had in the past. Last week's was very structured. Um, we had a lot of information to get through and a lot of uh, content to bring across. So, uh, we figured let's be a little more, you know, kind of casual this week. Uh, so, uh, with that, again, if you're new to these Lumix live streams, make sure to like and subscribe the channel. Uh, it helps us out tremendously. Uh, make sure to hit the bell icon so that you get the notifications of, you know, when we're going live, which is every Tuesday, or every, I'm sorry, not every Tuesday, every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. So this time right now. Uh, and with that, uh, I'm going to bring Matt into the conversation and, uh, let's get this going. How's it going, Matt? It's going well, my arch rival, my nemesis, <laughs> Sean Robinson. <laughs> so oh, for yeah. those of you who don't know, this dates back to that dates back to a very long time ago. Everybody thought Sean and I had a problem with each other, and I'm never gonna drop it now. So oh, I'll, of I'll mention not. it every time. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, yeah, so so obviously this is a very exciting week for not just us, but um the filmmakers that we worked with, uh, and I think the the camera industry in general. And I think, um, you know, we can really start this with maybe a recap of what we did announce, what the BGH1 box camera is for those that uh, may have not tuned in on uh, Tuesday or may have not really thought it was something that they would be interested in. Uh, so can you give us a little bit of a rundown on it, Matt? Sure. So the BGH1 is a micro four thirds camera, uses a micro four thirds mount. Uh, I want to make sure everybody's aware it is the same exact mount as we use now on GH5 or GH5S, which means all the lens control and everything that you would expect works with this system. So it's fully compatible with Olympus lenses, Panasonic lenses, um, every mic micro fourth lens lens that's out there. There were some questions out there in the market about that. So I wanted to make sure we got that out of the way. It, it works just like a GH5 would with any lens. So <laughs> you'll, you'll, you should get that sort of experience with it. Uh, that light is being funneled onto a 10.2 megapixel sensor, which means it's, basically exactly 4096 pixels wide. So every pixel is used as a photo site for video, giving you exactly 4096 by 2160 in the uh, 17 by nine DCI 4K capture range. It does 4K up to 60 frames per second. Uh, in 60p, it can do 10 bit video. Uh, if you want 422 color, it can do that at up to 30 frames per second in 4K. Obviously all the 1080 files are also available in 10 bit 422. Uh, we offer all intracodecs, so for uh, people who have post-production workflows where they need to be able to color correct and push and pull the files around, you've got those all iCodecs to work with. Um, once you hit the sensor, uh, another benefit of the sensor, aside from its larger photo sites, uh, is the fact that it's got dual native ISO. So I'm sure this people on this channel have already heard this story over and over again, but I'll, I'll rehash it one more time. Uh, it, it effectively means you have two sweet spots for the sensor. Uh, it's like having two native film stocks in the camera. For log footage, it's 400 and 2000 for those native points. And that gives you better high ISO performance as well. So once you've got that, you've got dual memory card slots. Both of them are UHS-2. They gotta be if you're gonna do backup <laughs> recording with those all intra codecs. So they're both exactly the same speed. Uh, you I think the area of differentiation that I'm most excited about with the box camera are the IO ports or the input output ports. So, you know, most GH users, uh, if they're using monitors are using HDMI, this camera provides you with HDMI and SDI, and they can both be used simultaneously. So on camera monitoring, it's great for SDI because there's less latency for SDI works better as a monitoring output. Uh, also, if you want to use an, uh, a viewfinder, like a Gradical from Zacuto, 
It's a great way to use that device is over SDI, especially since Secuto and some other companies have less expensive options that are SDI and they actually have to charge more for an HDMI option for a viewfinder. So it works well for those applications. Also works well for broadcast applications. I think a lot of people forget that a camera like this can be used as a broadcast camera. And frankly, there's a lot of interest in it on the broadcast side right now <laughs> from all the emails I've been getting. Oh, yeah. Um, and so, you know, there's very few 4K broadcasts, if any at all. Uh, none of the networks in the United States uh, are broadcasting in 4K. Very few stations have transitioned to ATSC 3.0, which is what's required. So 1080 as a broadcast output, perfectly acceptable for those applications. So that SDI output is going to get a lot of use on the camera. Um, also for broadcast, they want time code and they want gen lock because especially for sports uh, or if you're doing an array, um, anybody who's watched the NBA finals that were just happening or if you're a football fan, um, there's a company called 40 Replay and um, they build these massive camera arrays of like 50 or 60 cameras. And it's like bullet time on steroids where they can show you the play from any angle. And because it's capturing video instead of still images, it gives you a really cool 360 view of the field. Um, you need Genlock for that to work correctly. And so it offers Genlock for that. Um, and so we think that's a big benefit to the product. And then aside from that, you also are getting full size HDMI for recording, which you talked about earlier. And then the two important, Probably the two most important ports, especially for you, Sean, uh, yeah. the USB-C port and especially the Ethernet port. So um, it's really about what we can do with those ports for controlling the camera, potentially powering the camera over Ethernet. And then what we can do today for video images through those ports and what we'll be able to do in the future for Ethernet. So uh, why don't we – they've heard me talk enough. They've just seen me kind of <laughs> nodding. So why don't we turn it over to you and you can – you can cover a few points as well. Yeah, yeah. And and again, you know, as, as Matt was saying, there are so many different IOs on this camera. So you have all the broadcast, you know, kind of goodness that you'd want. You have the kind of more traditional cinematic or run and gun video style connections that a lot of us have been used to. But I think what a lot of people may not have fully grasped at the launch of this as to why this is such an ex exciting camera for us is that Ethernet port and the USB-C port and what it adds in connectivity for us. Um, like any of you that have seen the, the presentation we did on Tuesday and what I was saying during that about how being able to slim down your entire kit into just an Ethernet port cable coming off the back of the camera for both power and uh, video delivery is is huge for a number of different applications. Obviously, you know, there's a couple out there that we're talking about how this is going to make a great webcam. And I think people may be getting off put by the phrase webcam um, because of what we're all used to thinking of, you know, the little dinky things that have, you know, really bad image quality by comparison. But that term has actually evolved over, especially over the last six months. A webcam really kind of encompasses this, like what we're doing here. So a live broadcast where, you know, laptop webcams or the little kind of ones you can just buy and plug in USB, they're not really good enough, especially when you're a company that's in the imaging industry. You need something that's going to have much, much higher quality. Or if you're a broadcast studio and you need to have a number of cameras sent out to do an, to film an interview, to have a conversation with clients, uh, or even do stuff like, uh, there's a number of YouTube channels that do these kind of interviews and broadcasts where it's the host has to be socially distanced now from other locations and they have the cameras on their end. So you also need the ability to have the high quality footage so that when you get it back and you master it for your end result, you've got everything the way you need it. So the Ethernet port and the USB-C port and what we can do over them is huge in that market. Uh, and in a little bit, we'll jump over and actually show you guys the Multicam app, uh, the software side of it as to why it's so cool. Um, but I want to, aside from all that, because the the when I actually start showing the software, it'll make a little more sense than just rambling on about the connectivity. But um, there was actually a question in here, Matt, from VFX Todd. Uh, who, again, hey, welcome mm -hmm. back, everyone that's been joining us for all these times. Uh, we, we really appreciate you guys being here. Um, VFX Todd asks, uh, can the BGH-1 be used as a cinema camera, or is it best suited for broadcast and action camera? And I want to let you take 
your your opinion and approach on that, and then I'll add my two cents. The, the, the reality is I think it does all of those things well. And then beyond that, um, because it's so perfectly balanced, it's a great gimbal or drone camera as well. So, you know, I, I think there's lots of applications where it works great as a cinema camera, and then I can immediately move it into another avenue. I think the launch video that we put together, there was a lot of truth in what was presented by the filmmakers in that piece. I think uh, Royster Productions sort of illustrates it best because, you know, if you're a production company, you're not just focused on cinematography. You're also going to be doing live events. You're going to be doing streaming applications. You're going to be doing commercial work. And to have a tool that can do all of those different things and do them effectively uh, is kind of rare in this market. Um, now, obviously, big cinema cameras have a lot of the functionality that's needed. And then you can add pieces to the equation to turn them into a live streaming camera or turn them into a live event camera. But they're much larger they typically uh, require a lot more cost in order to be able to get them built out to what you need them to be. Uh, whereas this product is very self-contained and can sort of just move from job to job without a lot of additional investment to make it work. Uh, now, there are certain applications where it's not gonna be desirable to use a box camera. You know, there are benefits, especially for documentary work, to be in a GH5 or a GH5S a more incognito form factor. You don't need to add a monitor to, to the solution. Uh, the GH5 has awesome image stabilization, as everybody already knows. So as a run and gun documentary camera, you know there, there may be times where you would prefer the GH5 over working with a box camera. But with the name VFX in your tagline, I'm going to guess you do some VFX work. Um, you know, if you're doing VFX works, it's nice to be able to take two to three, four cameras, have them all on a single computer interface and be able to get all your settings populated to all the cameras at one time, do all monitoring from your computer, hit a single button to trigger all camera recording, and then capture all that in 10 bit. And it's just going to make your workflow smoother. So I think for what you do, if you are in VFX, there's certainly a benefit to a product like this, especially when you can gen lock with it and keep everything perfectly in sync. So, you know, we're seeing a lot of people needing to build environments for cinema applications uh, yeah. virtually. And this gives us that ability to do that as well. So, you know, I, I liken this camera to like the best Leatherman that you've ever had, like the best multi-tool that you could possibly ask for because it does so many different applications at such a high level um, that it, it effectively can plug into just about anything you'd want. Um, yeah. if I were a YouTuber starting out as an example, um, you know, kind of transitioning from a smartphone or transitioning from a point and shoot camera, this camera would probably be at the top of my list for consideration because of its live streaming capabilities, uh, the ability to build it out for bigger jobs, um, a simple monitor attached to it, or use the Lumix sync app and I can use it for monitoring and control. Uh, it gives me so much flexibility that I know that that investment will carry me through for a lot of years. And that's where I think the box camera excels is in its flexibility. Yeah. And, and I mean, even, even David, um, uh, David C. Smith was talking about that in the broadcast about how the array work that they do, which is currently featuring GH five S's, I believe he said, right. You know, those are, yeah. those are scenes that are being shot for major motion picture. You know, the, the, all the, the scenes you see outside of cars. So, his whole kind of comment on this, not to speak on behalf of him, but it's what he stated in the in the launch of it, was you know that having th having all the ports that are actually more commonly found and standard in broadcast and in cinema, uh, you know productions, is huge for them because it now it just easily plugs into the workflow, and I think even Jean pointed that out as well. That you know yes, are you going to be you know wanting to have 4k over sdi it would be nice but 1080 ever sdi just so that you've got a feed over to video village so you know being sent out over their wireless transmission that's the important part of it for them because that recording is all being done locally you know at the the camera itself and being able to actively be able to monitor all these things as matt pointed out with limited um much less latency than what hdmi has and not having to create your own 
you know, kind of Franken control system for it is why this will be big in, in video production and cinema production, I think. And then obviously again, our, our production or broadcasting kind of concept, it's, it's huge. Um, I want to, there was a, a question that came in that kind of actually dovetails to what you were talking about, Matt, a second ago for platforms like YouTubers and the the new generation of, of broadcasters is the way I like to kind of call it. Uh, a lot of people look down on the YouTube scene uh, as content, but the fact is, is that it's one of the fastest, it is the fastest growing and it's the number one way people are kind of, you know, consuming content these days. So why not, you know, find a way that a camera can fit into that market, but the question came from Red Bit. Uh, I was talking about the network connectivity and control of the camera. Um, the question is, is it controllable even over Wi-Fi or is it only on the RJ45? Which, for those that don't know, RJ45 is the proper name for the LAN port on the back of the camera. Um, and, you know, to, to answer that, yes, you have full control of the camera via your mobile device. So just like all of the rest of our Lumix cameras, you've got Lumix Sync app that gives you uh, the viewfinder capabilities. You have all the camera control capability in it. Um, it ends up just being great. You have all of that control here. So total, like out of the box with a mobile device or a tablet, a lens, the camera and a battery, you could just go right out and start shooting with this. You don't necessarily need all of these connections on it. Um, so the question is, Matt, like, hey, have you uh, used the Wi-Fi control on the camera yet? I know you and I have been working a lot with Ethernet and USB, but... So there's, as of today, there are some limitations with Wi-Fi to the computer. Um, so, you know, we, we have to prioritize the features we think are gonna be most useful um, right away. And so the primary priorities were to make sure Ethernet and USB-C were functional at launch. Um, we have aspirations of doing things like uh, RTMP wireless control and wireless streaming with the product. Uh, it's not foreign to us as a brand. Our, our X1500, X2000, CX10 cameras, the CX350, yeah, those cameras can all do RTMP MP. over wireless and do it <laughs> Wi-Fi. Um, Oh, sorry, RP, R, well, they could do RTSP or MCMP. They could do both yeah. um, wirelessly. So, you know, it's not foreign to us whether or not um, we'll be able to do that uh, right away or at any point with this box camera. That's still sort of left to the, our, our engineers. I, I think, I think the reality is I think we learned a lot with the launch of the X1500 and the X2000. When we put so much effort and energy into RTMP functionality, only to realize that we're probably two to three years ahead of where the market is <laughs> for people being able to actually live stream directly from their camera without having to interface much with the computer. So some of this is just having to prioritize what's important today versus what's important down the road. Um, and whether or not those things will ever come to this camera, I can't completely promise. But again, I wanted to make you aware that we're listening and mm -hmm. the more feedback we get, the the more we're going to push. Just like I'm sure there's going to be questions about NDI that are going to come up in the chat. And, oh uh, yeah. NDI HX. And you know, there's nothing, there's nothing hardware wise that prevents us from being able to do it. Again, it's all about priorities. Um, so the more feedback we hear on NDI and NDI HX, the more we'll funnel that up and, and see if we can't get it added. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that I think is, is just kind of rounding back to that point that, you know, this really does, as you said, this becomes the, the perfect Leatherman or the Swiss army knife of the kind of cameras that you want to do because easily, and I, I, I've already got parts on order so that I can start doing this, uh, after talking with David and them, uh, you know, being able to take this camera down off the wall, off my uh, mount here, and attach it to my motorcycle, so I can capture some some really cool, high quality, you know, footage of riding the bike through the twisty side roads out in the the hills of Austin, um, and then be able to just take it, plug it back up here with one cable plug in, and go right back into streaming. I think there's so many different capabilities of this camera that really it's it's such a simplified product because as a lot of people have pointed out, you know, well, what's, what's the point if you've already got a GH five S or you've already got a GH five, you know, what, what's the point in going to a camera that doesn't have a viewfinder or an LCD screen. And it's, it's that 
the kind of joke and, and comment everyone makes about, you know, well, thinking outside of the box. Well, but you can also just come back and actually just refine the box and make it a much better experience to actually utilize in the, the vastly different environments for it. And I'm really excited to see what people actually start creating with it because the people I've had conversations with this are very ambitious with the ideas that they have for deploying this. I know uh, Nick Driftwood is in the comments and has been showing a bunch of stuff about with VR setups with it. And I know, Matt, uh, one of the things you've always talked about is volumetric, VR, like that application for it. I think having something in this kind of form factor that actually has the connections that you need, that you don't need adapters to make it work is going to be huge. Um, so kind of going along well, with... And something, yeah, uh, sorry, sorry, something I want to touch base with on VR, just so we're aware. Um, you know, obviously the Genlock port is very important for VR, which I'm sure Nick will confirm in the chat. But uh, <laughs> I, I think a, a, a lesser recognized benefit to the camera for VR is the fact that it has an open gate output. You know, we call it the anamorphic mode, but it's really a four by three aspect ratio image capture area. So I'm now able to capture with, you know, 210 degree angle lenses, uh, using maybe two cameras, and I'm gonna get a very high resolution 360 degree image that's easily stitched together versus having to stack four to five cameras. Now, obviously, if you use more cameras, you're gonna get more density out of the image, you're gonna get a better looking image. But number one, having that four by three region to be able to use as your um, starting point for the canvas, and the fact that it's gonna do that at up to 60 frames per second is very impressive in the product. Uh, it works terrifically for what people are trying to do with VR. And then when you get these cameras and you mount them close together, they're within a couple of millimeters of the same separation of the average human eye. So things like 3D applications become much more realistic looking with this solution as a 3D capture camera as well. So, you know, obviously with the, an with the anamorphic function, we also talk about de-squeezing and using it for cinema applications, but you have to think more expanded in how that canvas can be used for VR applications as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and as as uh, uh, Nick is putting in there, and 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 Nick, uh, we we definitely feed all of those kind of comments over. Um, he was asking, can we have twenty eight eighty by twenty eight eighty one to one recording in the camera for VR? <laughs> but that's that's the cool thing about this this platform. Go ahead, Matt. <laughs> no, maybe we'll go a little higher resolution than that, Nick. Let's push let's let's push a little further. We could probably go further than twenty eight eighty by twenty eight eighty if you want. <laughs> let, let let me see what we can do. Oh. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll put in a good word for you out there, Nick. You know, and, and for, for everybody that's, that's joining us again, this is actually the, the really cool part about the, you know, these streams that we're doing weekly, you know, the comments that you guys provide, the, the ideas that you guys have, you know, none of it falls on deaf ears. We report this stuff back up. Our teams are watching these chats. So when you guys mention stuff, it's getting seen by the people that need to be seeing it. So, um, obviously as a large company, you got to give time for things to be implemented if they even are be able to be implemented as Matt was saying. So, um, hang in there, just keep, keep giving us the, the, the feedback and, and comments that you guys have, cause it all always helps. Um, I want to address just a follow-up question from Redbit again, which was, um, back to the Wi-Fi capabilities. Uh, the question is what's the latency for video monitoring over Wi-Fi? Is it low enough to pull focus with confidence? Um, this is where I would, at least in my opinion, and Matt, uh, feel feel free to chime in um, with, with your opinion on it. But truthfully, I don't think any wireless uh, connectivity is maybe going to give you the confidence that you're looking for, for pulling focus in the sense that you're actually working and you need hypercritical focus with shallow depth of field. Um, is it perfectly fine for doing tap to focus? A hundred percent. Um, I use it all the time. Uh, but if it's something where you're going to be actively pulling focus, you know, very quickly, I probably wouldn't rely on any wireless system for that, that comes out of any, any consumer camera and even major higher end camera, unless you're using equipment specifically for that. Um, getting an SDI monitor, even just a basic simple one could be a small one. 
I think is going to give you infinitely better confidence than anything that you're going to have in this kind of price point, this kind of category. Uh, Matt, do you have any comments for that? Yeah, at this point, until we see what can be implemented with uh, the full implementation of Ethernet, um, it's hard for us to really be able to give a direction there. Um, currently, with the Lumix Tether app, or I'm sorry, Lumix Sync app, which is what you would use for this, uh, I wouldn't trust it for using off-camera focus pulling. I would, I would use a Teradek and have a separate monitor for that, just or or some reasonable facsimile that you can afford that gets as close to what Teradek is capable of. Uh, that that's effectively what is going to work best. And that's what you'll see on most productions. And you're just going to jack into the SDI port. You're going to pull focus right from there. Um, so as much as I'd love to be able to tell you, oh yeah, go right ahead and kind of give you the used car salesman pitch, you know, get you <laughs> sold and then just deal with the problem later on down the road. I'm, I'm not willing to do that. I think, no. I think you're going to not be satisfied with the results. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and kind of like we were saying with, with how inexpensive monitors across the board kind of are and the vastly different sizes you can get, whether they have SDI connections, which honestly for focus pulling, um, I know a lot of people have been asking in the Facebook groups, that's one of the reasons why we have SDI as well, is that SDI is a much lower latency, as Matt pointed out. So critical focus pulls use an SDI connection over an HDMI. HDMI gets you the higher quality um, in this implementation. But, I mean, I have an SDI monitor plugged in. It's the Shogun Inferno that's plugged in up into the side so that I can have something that is ultra low latency that if I do need to pull focus when I'm doing something, I have it. Uh, but otherwise, it's either... Ethernet out for camera control currently, and then HDMI out into my switcher so I can do these multi-different setups. The coolest part is the part I think that a lot of people overlooked, and Matt, you, you mentioned this before, all of these video signals are coming out at the same exact time. So my SDI monitor is projecting an image, my HDMI is projecting an image, and Ethernet's projecting an image onto my content PC for control. And I could still even be recording in the camera if I wanted to at the same time. So, yeah. And I think you have to sort of look down the road a little ways with what we're doing. Um, you know, today over Ethernet and delivery, uh, you're pretty happy with the latency you're seeing now with Ethernet. And that's not even with our full implementation of the RTSP functionality or RTP functionality. So we're still refining and have a plan for an even better implementation when we get closer to the launch of the next firmware update for the camera. So yeah. uh, keep one other thing in mind is that we've issued an SD, we just issued an SDK for the camera that's just been posted. And, you know, there's a lot of control that you can do um, over the USB, at least today. But mm -hmm. remember the control functionality is deliverable over ethernet as well. So who knows what the future could do, being able to use our preview image on a device and be able to pull focus using the internal motors in the camera instead of having to use an external tool um, can help to reduce the complexity of your setup, uh, can potentially help to lower cost for what you're trying to work with as well. So, you know, we're trying to make a product here that can be uh, modified by the market to make it fit the applications that you want it to fit. So our goal is to make that deliverable system, the system that's coming out of the camera as low latency as we can so that it can function with these third party accessories as they come available. Yeah. Yeah. And, and obviously, you know, this is a Panasonic product, so it comes with the backing of Panasonic quality. You know, we, we've been around for over a hundred years as a company, we've been doing mirrorless cameras for how, how long now? Mirrorless cameras is what, 11 years since the first 11 or 12 years since the first, uh, GH going on camera? 12, going on 12. Yeah. You know, so we, we were, you know, the, the pioneers in this category in bringing professional level, you know, capabilities down into a consumer level product. And, and don't be off put when I say professional to consumer. Yes, it's a professional product. But when I say professional, I mean like Vericam and, you know, ultra cinema cameras. So know that, you know, our, our track record, I believe, you know, kind of stands pretty, pretty strong on its own that when we put a camera out, we're supporting it. Um, the firmware updates that are coming, the SDK, which is a first for the Lumix series and in, in the time I've been around, 
you know, an SDK to actually encourage people to create and find new ways to control these things and fit it into your workflows or into your production needs um, is kind of a really, really cool thing for, for uh, uh, a company like ours to be uh, actually promoting now. Um, I want to jump over, Matt, and uh, before we go too long, because uh, there's actually a couple questions that we're asking things like, um, uh, this one comes from FC... 252 was can the bgh1 take still photos as well and i think that's a good segue to actually jump over and start showing the multicam app uh what do you think yeah especially since you can't take pictures without it i'm gonna go with yeah that's probably a good time to show it yeah so uh all right uh we're back on my main camera now but what i'm gonna do is i'm jumped over here and you guys should now be seeing my desktop here and you should still be able to hear matt I think I think Matt's still there, but um, yeah, theoretically, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm still here. They should be able to hear me. Yeah. So so what's what's really cool about this? And um, I, I'm going to cover the photo thing first uh, uh, for uh, FC. A hundred percent, you can still control this camera for um, uh, photography on this. Uh, now again, I'm using an earlier uh, pre-production version of this camera, so hardware is not 100% finalized with what I have and with my computer. So, um, apologies for any weirdities that you might see at the moment now. But uh, for photography use on this camera, you, it's the same interface that we have for the Lumix Tether uh, software for the photography side. But all you're going to do is click on the record mode, and then you'll see P A S and M which are just your basic photo recording modes. When you switch over to it, which I'm not going to do at the moment, when you switch over to it, you get shutter, aperture, ISO, all of those different controls, and you can take high-resolution JPEG stills just by clicking the camera shutter button, and they come out great. You get all your metering. Every single thing you'd expect to have control over is there. Um, so hopefully that answers your stills, stills photo question. But uh, Matt, what, what are uh, some of the cool things in the app that, that you really have kind of enjoyed using? Well, so let's first define that there's anywhere from two to three screens that you can see with the app, right? So we have one screen that's the control interface, which is, I would say, the equivalent of hitting the quick menu button on a Lumix camera. That's basically what you see in that function. Yeah. Um, with a couple of differences in the upper left-hand corner, there's an LV button, which brings your live view screen up. Um, and then there's a camera button, which we'll talk about in just a minute. So um, once you go through, everything is just touch with your mouse click and you can make adjustments as you've already shown. Um, as we go to the bottom, there's a settings menu, a couple of points I wanna show in the settings menu right now. Yep. Uh, and, and just so everybody knows, I'm totally flying blind right now. I don't get to see what you guys are seeing. So, <laughs> so uh, as, as, as Matt says stuff, that, I'm pulling it up on the camera and highlighting it with the mouse, so. So under settings, one of the things I, I personally use with the box camera already um, is the ability to have your video images or photos offloaded into a remote computer. So you can set up a folder and have your video images after you've recorded each one come offloaded and brought right into that folder. Uh, this is a great feature. And frankly, something that I could see like lower level high schools or colleges using because the camera could do 240 frames per second slow-mos at a very low price point. So you could have it set up and have your slow-mo footage when you hit record for each of those slam dunks in a basketball game. That footage ends up here. I can quickly pull it in for my replay and go ahead and show slow-mo replays from that, which I think is just awesome that it does that. And it's relatively fast to be able to transfer it, especially for the application I just mentioned. It'd be great for that. Yeah. Um, the other thing I think is really cool is that if you look on the screen, you'll see the ability to take the firmware and push it through the computer instead of having to offload it onto a memory card and stick it into the camera and then pull it from there. You know, there, there are going to be times where these cameras are installed in remote locations and won't be touched for months at a time. Um, and so it's much better to be able to just push that firmware over versus having to load it on a memory card. So um, frankly, I would love to see that functionality make it into more of our cameras because I would love to be able to just push firmware from the Lumix Tether app for every one of our cameras. It's just an awesome way of doing it. Um, so let us go back up to the top and you'll see that camera setting. So when you press camera, that's going to bring up a new menu. And in that menu, you'll see one BGH one camera. That's Sean's that he's using right now. Um, depending on how fast your computer is, how, how well set up your network is, you can 
monitor up to 12 cameras at the same time. So you can select each of them and set them up the way you need to. Or you can go to the uh, all cameras option. You can check all cameras and frankly have all the cameras available at one time for monitoring if need be. Uh, depending on your computer, you might see, hear that fan spinning really, really fast in your computer, depending on what your computer is capable of. But that's a pretty amazing feature set to be able to do, um, which I think is awesome. As we move across to where the preview screen is, the other features that I've come to really enjoy, first off is menu. You know, this is something that's new. We've never had access to the full menu of the camera uh, from our Tether app and you can bring up the menu and you can control everything as if you're in the camera. Uh, if you've ever used a touch screen in your life, hopefully all of you on this, pod, uh, <laughs> on this live stream have used a touch screen at least once or twice in your lives. Um, just use your mouse as if it's your finger and you can navigate all, all the menu options that you'd ever need. And then there are some additional quick access options. So if we get out of the menu, you'll see we have a white, ba a white balance or a white point set. Uh, I love using this because uh, when you do a custom white balance um, with a Lumix camera, it puts up a box and you kind of have to fill that box, which means you gotta, sometimes you can't fill it. You have to move the, uh, you have to move the white card close. And if you have to move the white card close, it's out of the light. So it's not the right white balance. Being able to do it with just a little dropper tool makes it super simple to be able to set your white balance. Um, depending on your application, for what Sean and I are doing, autofocus works great um, for this camera. I love the autofocus in this camera, but there are times where I just lock it in. So you can just put it in manual focus and there's a one touch autofocus option right there, which makes refocusing the camera easy. And you can just be in the situation I'm in and have it manual focus. Uh, I think those are the bulk of the things I really enjoy with the product. Um, yeah, Sean, I'm sure that you have some additions to that. Yeah. And, and, you know, just, just as Matt was saying, you know, having that ability to do, um, you know, to on the fly select whether or not you want autofocus, manual focus, like Matt said, normally I have this thing on, on autofocus, which I can just flip over right here with one button and we're there. Um, but a lot of times since I'm moving a whole lot right now and I'm using the 15 millimeter Sumalux on this camera, which to be honest, it's it's spectacular. I love this lens, but uh, I have not updated the firmware on this lens in a very long time um, because it's sat in my closet and I just wanted to tighten my field of view. Uh, so I just flipped it over to manual focus, but being able to click on one shot AF, have it lock into place, be able to control my aperture, which... That lens has an aperture ring on it, so I had it set on 1.7, but being able to come in and just change my aperture, change my entire look of the overall image, and what's cool is you have tenth of a stop uh, changes for aperture in this software, so I can come down to, say, f11, makes it look really dark, clearly, and then come up and shift my ISO, I'll jump up, still not good enough at f11, go down to, say, let's go down to f8. Go even higher, go 12,800, way too bright. Go down 10,000. It gives you all of that kind of control, and it's it's pretty immediate feedback. So let me change this all back so that I actually, I, you guys can actually see me and everything works fine. Uh, but it's just, it's such a simple, straightforward platform that, that updates in near real real time. As Matt said, this is the first implementation of this multicam software with it. But having that menu access, that full control to be able to come in, change all my settings, it's, it's really, really cool. Uh, and Matt, one of the things that actually I wanted to touch on because you love anamorphic shooting. I know you do. <laughs> We've talked about wanting to do a lot of anamorphic kind <laughs> yes. of stuff together. <laughs> um, yeah. Could you give I'm, the... a bit of a, I'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to anamorphic, yes. <laughs> Could you give a little bit of the info on this anamorphic de-squeeze display icon that I have here in the menu now? Yeah, so, so to be completely honest with you, um, this came up in like a Q&A session before we launched the camera. Um, I want to send a shout out to a, a, a friend of mine, um, uh, Andrew Reed from EOS HD, when he was being briefed on the camera, he asked me, hey, my how God. do you de-squeeze when uh, there's no monitor on the camera? And I honestly hadn't even thought of it. <laughs> so I went back and I tested to see what we could do for de-squeeze. And um, turns out you can de-squeeze over SDI for both playback as well as for the live, event, the live view. So SDI would be what you'd probably use for on-camera monitoring. Uh, you can only de-squeeze the playback for HDMI, so no, no de-squeeze of HDMI other than playback. 
But the feature that I found is you can de-squeeze over the Lumix Tether app. So if you bring it into Lumix Tether, and Sean can probably show it right now, yep. uh, he's going to look real fat in a hurry. He's going to stretch himself out. And so I can now do anamorphic production in live streams. And so I, so the first time I did this, I, this is this is ridiculous, but I had taken an Atlas uh, 65 millimeter anamorphic lens and I just quickly jumped on with, uh, with Sean for a quick teams meeting. And he was like, what the, what the hell? Is that an anamorphic lens that you're using now? And so I explained to him exactly what we did. So if you really want to up your live stream game and step up, get yourself some anamorphic lenses and get yourself a BGH one. Uh, by the way, uh, you can also do this with the S five. So if you use the S five with the Lumix tether, uh, for for streaming app, you can de-squeeze that too for Amorphic if you want to. So it's a <laughs> it's a pretty awesome feature set. I don't know how many of you will ever use it. I'm sure all of you are rolling your eyes right now at the entire concept, except for Nick Drift, who is going to do it like tomorrow, I guarantee. Oh, um, yeah. But I, th I just think it's super cool that you can do that now with your live streams. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's definitely one of those like really, really cool things to have set up. And uh, um, for the last couple of minutes, everybody, I haven't been able to see... Uh, the comments. So I'm going to jump back and see if anyone's had other questions here about it. Um, uh, oh, okay. As, as Nick pointed out, some of you may have noticed this. So I, I mentioned this a couple of times in the earlier uh, Lumix lives that we've done, but I'm using hue led bulbs back here uh, behind me. Those things, if you were here from the beginning and Matt, Matt can attest to this too, because um, there's a lot of headache when it comes to certain LED lights. These things cycle like crazy and they look horrible when you don't have the shutter angle set properly. Uh, which again, that's actually something that we didn't talk about. You also have your shutter speed, shutter angle, things like that, as you would expect in a camera like this. Uh, Nick Driftwood pointed out that I have my shutter angle is at 216 degrees shooting in 4k 60p because otherwise, it looks god-awful. If I change this down to 180, see all that lovely banding that's going on in the back there? Matt, you can't see. Actually, you can see it because I'm using a camera for the secondary camera that doesn't have shutter angle. But uh, yeah, once I change this up to 216, that banding goes away. That's a nice reason to be able to have this kind of control in in on a on a computer and not having to reach up and grab the camera to change any of these settings it it makes things so so simple across the board for everybody um and as as albert noticed that yes I, I i did change the lights in the background it's blue and orange now um anyway uh yeah are you, are you a denver broncos fan is that why you did that no, no. I just, I just think complimentary colors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So for those of you, for those of you who don't know, Sean's not a big sports ball fan. Not a, not a big sports fan, Sean Rob. Motor, no. Motorsports, yes. Sports yes. Ball, no. Yes. Hundred percent motorsports, yes. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not one of them people that plays the foosball. Uh, so let's see what, what, what are the questions we have in here? Uh, and what, while I'm looking at this, Matt, if there's anything you want to bring up, um, that you think we missed, uh, feel free to jump in. I got to dig through some of these questions here. Let's see here. So I guess one, uh, attention to detail feature that I probably should mention. Um, I, I was really excited about it. Some of you might think it's silly. Um, they've actually incorporated a Kensington lock on the back of the, the camera as well. So there's a place you can tie in a little uh, tether so you can lock it down. Again, uh, I, I can envision people installing this in remote locations where uh, they're doing a production and they're not going to monitor the camera at all. And the last thing you need at a bar when you're doing a live event is to have some drunken idiot steal your camera and walk <laughs> off with it. So, or even a sober idiot for that matter. So it's a good way to keep your camera safe, which I thought was a nice attention to detail feature. Um, also, cutting off the edges of the corners was an intentional design decision because they don't want you having to drag your finger constantly across a sharp edge or a pointy edge as you're having to make control adjustments. Um, so that was intentional so that it's not uncomfortable to use the product. Uh, it also provided an added benefit where they put the tally light um, 
it gives you more angles to be able to see it during a production. So if people are to the sides of the camera, they know that the camera's rolling. Um, these are just little attention to detail things that I was really impressed that our engineers had thought of. Uh, in fact, the design engineer, if you saw the, the, the video on Tuesday, uh, the Kensington came from personal experience because he's done production and it's experiences that he's had trying to secure his cameras when he has them in remote locations. So uh, yeah. I, I like those kind of little attention to details that, that we got from the product. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. For some of the people asking in here, um, uh, let's see here. One of them was asking what version of the Tether app that was. Uh, that's the Lumix Tether for Multicam app. So that's the one that came out for primarily for the BGH1 box camera. Um, so that gives us all that, that control that we need there. Um, uh, before we go into some of the questions that are actually, sorry, I'm reading questions from Jack that's uh, also in the chat monitoring here. Um, before we go into the kind of slightly more off-topic uh, questions you guys have been having, uh, there's a couple people asking questions about the S1R, the S1, um, and I'm going to ask you a couple questions about that, Matt, uh, about the differences in sensors and stuff like that. Um, if you can give us some high level there. But uh, as a reminder for everybody, um, these events are live every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. If you are new to this channel, make sure to give us a like, subscribe if you like the content. Uh, it helps us continue to bring these these uh, uh, events to you guys every single week. Um, the live event stream that we did for the launch of the camera is active still on the page. So you can, when you're done watching this one, you can go back and watch the official launch, uh, which has the interview with the uh, development team in Japan, as well as an interview with uh, three or uh, yeah, three filmmakers. Um, David C. Smith to hear more and John Tyson, uh, on their uses of the cameras in the real world. So if you have time, uh, it's definitely one of those, you can just throw it on, minimize it, and just kind of listen to the conversation there. Um, there's some really cool insight there for it. But, um, now that we got past that, um, I have one last question on the BGH one for you, Matt, because I haven't tested this, but I would assume that this would work. Uh, and this comes from, where did I just see it? I think it came from FC252 again. So if you have 12 of these cameras hooked up and you can control all the cameras, you could technically, um, now granted none of us have tested this yet, you could probably trigger the photos across all of those cameras, right? At the same, same ish time. Yeah. 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 So, that's the idea. And, yeah. and keep in mind that the 12, that 12 limit that's a Lumix tether for box limit. That's not a limit of the camera. So, you know, we're going to have an, we're, we're going to offer an SDK. So, you know, there's no reason in the world people can't go well beyond what we're capable of with the, with the Lumix for tether. I'm yeah. oh, sorry, Lumix tether for, for uh multi-cam. <laughs> so for, for uh, uh, FC. So basically for your answers, you, you could theoretically be able to do bullet time effect with this. Uh, and if you look at some sort of dedicated application, if you want to write or have someone create their own control protocol with it, because we have that SDK out, you could have an entire setup that you just array your cameras and one click be able to trigger all of them. So that's what's so cool about this camera is that I think really what the community does with it, what the, pro the production houses do with it, what the specialty houses begin to modify and make their own control systems for in all the different places that this camera can fit into. That's where I think the magic's really going to come from with this, this platform uh, as a first for Lumix. Um, but, but Sean, Sean, there's one thing I want to throw in there though. Mm -hmm. um, for a bullet time application, I don't know that I would do it for photography. I would probably just put the camera into the anamorphic mode, gen lock everything. And then I can just rip, rip a video image and then have all of those cameras dump their file right into my folder so that I have it all compiled as just short video clips. And then I can have it all compiled from there. So then you can write a third-party application to be able to look in that folder and then assemble it for you in post. So that's how I would do it because there's no resolution advantage to doing it as a photo file. It, yeah. it would be one thing if it was like a 25 or 30 megapixel photo image and it's only like a 10 megapixel, 
you know, or like an eight, a 4K video image. There's really not any loss in resolution at this point. So you're actually better off just doing that as a video file. But just my two cents. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and all right. I, I have to ask a question because a bunch of people are saying that they see me on a Mac. I have no idea what you're talking about. I got to, I mean, I have Mac computers. If you're even referencing me, I have no idea. Um, it totally off topic, but it caught me off guard there that the desktop I was showing was a PC desktop, by the way. Um, now Matt, th there is a question in here, um, that I know you and I have talked a lot about, and we did mention it during the Q and a on Tuesday, but, and that was about internal NDs. For those that have, you, you mm -hmm. know, that we're asking, there's a lot of people that are saying that that is a major missing feature in the camera, but I think you have a really good explanation that kind of really shows that, you know, why it's not so simple. Um, if you could enlighten some people or at least give, give an opinion. <laughs> So, so, for, so, so first of all, Sean, I've never heard of a neutral density filter. What is that exactly? Uh, I'm joking. Um, so the, the truth is we asked. I promise you it was thought about. It was considered. It was discussed and vacillated over. The issue ultimately is the sensor is roughly 19 millimeters wide by 13 millimeters high. And so the ND filter that would have to cover it would have to be at least 19 by 13. That is assuming that there are no mechanicals that have to move it into place and how far we have to clear the sensor area, which is it would have to completely clear the flange. If it stays anywhere within the flange area, you run the risk of flaring and other problems getting onto the sensor. So that thing has to mechanically clear completely the mount of the camera. So there's just not 19 millimeters of width or 13 millimeters of height available for us to move it into those spaces. So the alternate that people say is, well, just use one of those liquid crystal NDs, like what Sony has on the FX, uh, the FX9 or what uh, Zcam's offering that you can slide into the mount and then you can control it that way. Well, those devices move out of the way on the Sony and they move out of the way by removing it from the Zcam product. Uh, and the reason you want to be able to move it is that it eats light. So even when it's being asked to be clear, it's not light transmissive clear. It's going to have some loss of light when you go through it, typically about a stop. And so we can't just leave an ND in place permanently and then just bury the ND's intensity unless we're willing to cost ourselves a full stop of light gathering which we're just not willing to do. Um, some could argue we could have made the camera wider, we could have made the camera taller. Sure, we could have done those things, but then we start to really limit its effectiveness for things like VR applications or array applications. And so there was a lot of thought that went into what we wanted to do with this camera and the markets that we saw it working in. And the truth is, is that we can add neutral density filters as external accessories but I can't just chop the sides of the camera off to make fit in a smaller space if they haven't already reduced it. So it was an intentional design decision. It's about maintaining the size for maximum flexibility. And I realized that this isn't the answer all of you want to hear. Truth be told, it's not the answer I want to hear either. I would love it to have a new <laughs> We all wanted to have this. This is not a foreign idea. And, and trust me, we, we would love to be able to do it. I wish we could have figured out a way to make this work, but it's just not feasible at this time. And again, I apologize, but that's just the answer I have. Yeah. Yeah. And, and as a follow-up for uh, uh, FC uh, questions just had said, uh, instead of ND filters, why not make ISO down to something like 10, five or one? And that from a technical perspective, doesn't actually do anything for you. Because like Matt was saying before, the way the camera circuitry is built, you have native ISO areas. Um, those are the areas where you're getting maximum dynamic range and uh, minimum amounts of noise. So you get the best looking image out of it, the best data to work with. Anytime you go below any of those basic um, points, you're either compressing your highlight information and losing dynamic range that way, or if you go above those numbers, you're adding noise, which is effectively reducing dynamic range in the shadow area. 
So just to be able to say, oh, hey, a camera can go down to 10 ISO or 64 ISO, you're getting such a loss there by doing it that it's still better to just slap an ND filter on the front of the lens or if an adapter is made that has them in there, like that kind of thing. You're going to get a much, much better looking image than just pulling the, the gain way down on the sensor. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a good feasible way to, to design anything, honestly. Um, now, the last question I want to get to, because um, we're coming up on 2 o'clock, and we actually have a relatively hard stop at 2 o'clock uh, for this week's uh, session. Uh, and as a comment also for Keith, uh, I did see your comment, and we will pass that on to the engineers with the SDK conversations. But um, there's a lot of people asking, Matt, about the S S1R, uh, how we announced that the S5, you know, that we're going to be bringing... Um, firmware updates to those cameras. Now, for everybody out there, we do not have any more information other than what was announced with the S5. But uh, could you give everyone a little bit of information, Matt, on what the differences are between the S1 and the S1R sensor? Um, typically, because obviously the S1R, for those that don't know, can do 4K 60p with a slight crop near full frame versus the S1, which is into the Super 35 area. Okay, so the S1R um, is a 47 megapixel sensor versus a 24 megapixel sensor. So um, it's, it's obviously uh, a sensor that has some unique technologies because it can output at a faster readout speed than what the 24 megapixel sensor that's in the S1 is capable of. But one of the reasons it has the faster readout speed is that we can do something called binning the sensor, which you effectively take four pixels and you turn them into one bigger pixel. Um, and so you do that for green, red, and blue. So what we're able to do is we're able to properly bin that camera and it ends up at about a one, one crop. So it's technically not the full sensor width, but it's virtually a full, you know, 36 millimeter, you know, diagonal sensor size. It's slightly under that. Uh, but because it's binned, we can now refresh the sensor at 60 frames per second instead of a limitation of 30 frames per second, which is the limitation of the S1 and the S5 and the S1H. So um, it's a really advanced sensor. And from my evaluations of it as a binned image, it's a really good looking image. Is it as sharp as what you're getting out of an S1 in the final 4K image? No, but it's certainly passable. And the nice thing here is it's purely binned. There's not any line skipping that's being applied. So the line skipping is where you start to get uh, a lot of aliasing issues. And I don't see a lot of that infer issue with the S1R. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to see what this camera can do when we implement the S5's autofocus with it, because you have that faster readout speed. It's gonna be very interesting. Again, Sean and I have no idea uh, how that's going to be implemented on the S1R. You know, full disclosure, we haven't seen the next firmware for the S1R. Neither one of us has. Um, yep. <laughs> uh, you, know, you guys aren't stupid. You know we get access to this stuff earlier. But in this instance, we haven't had a chance to even try it yet. But the very first thing I'm going to do when I get the preliminary firmware is to test the autofocus of the S1R. Of because course. Because I'm very interested to see what it can do with that output. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, obviously there's, that's the kind of basics of with the sensors there. Yes, there's all that kind of cool stuff coming. We don't know what's coming in the actual firmware when it comes out, other than what was stated when we made the announcement with the S5. Um, so just hang tight. If you want more information on that, just get subscribed, um, get on the email threads, all that kind of stuff, because that is where you'll hear the information. Um, obviously, as you saw on Tuesday, Lumix Live is one of the platforms that we are now starting to use, not guarantee, but it's something that we, we did utilize to launch with the uh, uh, BGH1. Um, so make sure you're just staying subscribed because the information will come here as well as all the other platforms. Um, the last question I want to uh, address uh, is actually coming from a number of people asking about raw video recording. I don't want you guys to think that we're ignoring you. Um, we see the questions about raw recording. Um, and I, it's the same thing, uh, not to speak for Matt, but it's the same thing that both of us have been saying. We don't know. Um, right now, there, there's no raw recording. So if it ever gets it, who knows? Uh, 
we're in the same boat as you guys are uh, on that one. But uh, I think, honestly, Matt, may, maybe you can chime in on this, but like in the current use case for the box camera, there's not a massive need for RAW in a lot of broadcast platforms, correct? Not for broadcast, but, you know, I, I could understand people's desire to have RAW. I mean, yeah. you know, there's a another box camera that does some RAW internal recording. Um, and in a cinema application where RAW would be beneficial, you're still going to have to add a monitor to their product. And so having, like, external RAW on a product like this sort of negates that drawback of not being able to record internal, right? Because you're going to have to make the investment of a monitor either way. So I certainly understand the desire to have it. Just keep asking us for it and we'll keep feeding it up. I think that's the key. If Japan knows you want it and you make a big enough push for it, we have a really good track record of making these things happen. So, you know, just keep asking and we'll we'll do our best to, to make sure that we can do it if it's possible. Yeah. So with that, um, I want to actually wind this stream up. Uh, we're right at about 2 o'clock, and uh, uh, unfortunately, we actually have other business that, uh, you know, internal meetings and all that kind of fun stuff that, that, that we have to actually get to. So I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us today. This was, uh, like I said, this is a bit more of a kind of casual stream, just a conversation about all this stuff. Um, we really appreciate all the comments that, that you guys uh drop into the chat and the help that everyone gives each other in the chat as well. Uh, this is a platform we love and we are continuing to uh, build on over the next uh, year or so. So um, with that, a couple things to mention. Next week's Lumix Live is back to a bit more of a photo-oriented Lumix Live session. So if you're interested in photojournalism uh, and hearing from a working photojournalist um, that's actually here in the U.S., uh, tune in for that. Uh, feel free to bring your questions, uh, tune in, just, you know, set it on as an audio podcast. I would love to be able to send this out as an audio podcast as well, but maybe that's for next season. Um, and then the, uh, just like we did last month, the last, uh, Thursday of the month. So in two weeks, that will be our live AMA session. So general AMA, that is across anything that you guys have been asking us over the last month that we haven't really you know, dug into in questions that obviously we can't answer. Uh, feel free to be adding comments to these que these uh, videos when they post live on the channel uh, or bring your questions on that session as well. Uh, it's another format like this, more open, uh, more demonstrations, you know, based on what you guys want to hear. So uh, make sure to like, subscribe, uh, get, you know, the bell icon on all that fun YouTube stuff. Uh, and we will end up seeing you guys next Thursday because I definitely need a break after all these streams this week. I don't know about you, Matt. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm ready for the weekend, but we're good. Yeah. All right. Well, again, thanks, everybody. We will see you all next week on Thursday at 2 p.m. Take care. <laughs>